o'clock, so we're going to get started with a word of prayer. Invite the Lord into this place tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love and faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the rain, Lord, that we can that we can see to replenish as the earth, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would touch us tonight and that you would that you would speak to us and send your Holy Spirit into this place, Lord. Lord, we give you glory and we give you honor tonight. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Can you stand with us if you can?
Well, we have some lovely treats on the table over there, and you're going to sing to wish these two lovely people a happy birthday. If you did not grab a treat before you were seated, you may go do that after we sing. Let's go ahead and sing happy birthday to Paul and Lily. Happy birthday to you. Because I, I can't get the all the words out uh, one, in one beat. So. <laughs> well, just a couple of announcements this evening. Our Heritage Hero Luncheon is coming up on Thursday, March 21st at 10 o'clock at Lancaster City Church. If you would like to be a part of that, the tickets are $15, but if you need assistance in paying for a ticket, please come and see myself or Larry will be happy to assist with that. And it's going to be a great time honoring some uh, heroes of the faith from senior ministry all over the Mojave Desert region. And um, Pastor Paul and Norma will be speaking at that event along with special musical guests Johnny and Ruth Laring that we had at our Christmas banquet. So you don't want to miss that. The sign-up sheet is over there and we are offering transportation with church vans if you do not have a ride. So please go ahead and take part in that. Um, we will probably be leaving the church about 8 a.m. that morning, I think, um, as we have to be out in Lancaster at 10 a.m. So. Then the other event we have coming up is a senior adult cruise that Pastor Paul mentioned last week to us. Uh, it is actually being organized by Orange County First Assembly. And so we have some flyers over there with some additional information. If you'd like to be a part of that, space is limited and you must register by Friday, March 15th and put down a deposit if you'd like to go on that trip. So please feel free to get the information there if you'd like to be a part of that. Let's go ahead and prepare to receive this evening's offering. Lord, thank you so much for your many blessings to us. Lord, we pray that you would bless each gift and the giver tonight, Lord, as we present our tithes and offerings to you this evening, Lord. We pray that you would bless it to the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. while Pastor Ken prepares to come and share the word with us this evening. Preseason baseball is happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to do? <laughs> yeah. My favorite team lost their star player. Who's your favorite team? The Angels. Oh, sorry. Nice. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> yeah, did your favorite team assume my, my our star? <laughs> yeah, it did. Shohei Otani? <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, a, he's across town. Now. <laughs> yeah, he's across yeah. town, that's right. No <laughs> far, but, uh, but it's okay, you know, the Dodgers and Angels played yesterday, and the Angels won four zip, so yeah. you know, I'm happy about that. <laughs> Good call, Pastor. <laughs> of course, it's still spring training, so it doesn't really count. It doesn't mean anything. It's a long year. 
<laughs> All it is is bragging rights. That's it. That's a joke So where in the Bible does it mention baseball? <laughs> in the big inning. Oh. Oh my God. It doesn't get any better than this. We are here all week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you do that at the lab. <laughs> oh, let's go ahead and pray and invite the Lord into this place because, you know, we need him tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for giving us this time that we're about to embark on. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through this lesson, Lord. Lord, use us as your tools so that when we take this lesson and we impact our, our community with it, Lord, we ask that your spirit would reign, that your spirit would guide us and, and use us to speak the words that those in our community need to hear. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight's lesson is lesson number seven, Community in the Kingdom. The intro is the same as always. I'll go ahead and read it again. As God's Son, Jesus taught with unique authority, some of his most profound lessons, including the Sermon on the Mount, are found in Matthew's Gospel. Yes. When we put Jesus' teaching into practice, our faith is steadfast. It is built on the firm foundation of eternal truth. Church fellowship is kingdom fellowship. That is the central truth tonight. Okay, my, my laptop wants to do things. My laptop, my iPad. Oh, yeah, your, your Bible and your water's right there. Yeah, we'll cut that part out of the... Video. <laughs> okay, where am I at? Here we are. You can take care of that in editing. So the scripture reading is Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 35. Um, I'm not going to read all of it tonight. I'm going to read parts of it. The key verse is Matthew 18, 15. In the King James versions, it says, If thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. In the New Living Translation, it says, If any, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. When there's an offense between you and a brother or you and a sister, go to that person and say, you may not remember this because most of the time, those who did the offending don't remember. But this happened. And then if you bring it to their light, bring it to the light and they see what they've done, they'd be like, oh my goodness, can you please forgive me? You know, that type of a person is who we all should be. That's who we all need to be. The person who's, oh, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I did not mean for that to occur. I didn't mean for that to happen. In the classic television program, I'm going to skip back up a little bit. Gilligan's Island, seven people were shipwrecked and stranded on a deserted island. The individuals came from various segments of society. And the show depicted their struggles to live and work together so they could survive. The groups needed to swiftly deal with any problems that arose and keep pace and prevent disaster. I enjoyed Gilligan's Island when I was a kid. I watched the reruns. I didn't watch the original showing of Gilligan's Island. I enjoyed, I, I would be babysat by my grandmother every summer as a kid growing up and we had The Price is Right, and we had <laughs> Gilligan's Island, and we had Bonanza, and we had Andy Griffith's show. Yeah. Oh my goodness, we had them. Oh, Eat, Leave it to Beaver, yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness, there were so many shows that we used to just love watching. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, Gilligan's Island was one of them. Uh, <laughs> Gilligan, he was just a clumsy guy. <laughs> and it was it was hilarious to see the the different things that would happen between him and the skipper and 
you know, yeah. the professor who was could take bamboo and make a clock radio out of it. And I don't know how he did things like that, but it, it, whatever. It he was the professor. MacGyver. Yeah, yeah, MacGyver. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, and, and you had Mr. Howell and Mrs. Howell, and you had Ginger Ann and uh, Ginger and Mary Ann, and, and you had all this the different walks of life. You had the rich, and you had the poor. Gilligan, he was one of the poor. You had Mr. Howell and Mrs. Howell. I can't remember his name, Preston the Third or something. I don't remember. Thurston Howell. Thurston Howell the third, yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hey, you remember. <laughs> I watched them when they were original. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna tease you. <laughs> so what communities are you a part of? What factors make these communities work well or poorly together? There were so many times when they would have a raft that was built by everybody except Gilligan. And it was seaworthy, yeah. and it had a sail. Yes. And then Gilligan would touch it, and it would fall apart. <laughs> you know, and it was just, okay, that's the, did it work well? Yeah, they did, until he showed up, and then poorly together. Yeah, it worked poorly, because, you know, Gilligan would show up and destroy everything. <laughs> And he always felt bad about it afterwards and apologized and everybody loved him anyways and then you had your next show. <laughs> By using the term kingdom, Jesus was describing his followers as a community. A kingdom is made up of different kinds of people working together, serving one another, to serve one sovereign. Likewise, the Christian life is not a solo activity. As we serve God together, we enjoy the benefits and encounter the challenges of living in a community. In today's lesson, we will consider the community aspects of the kingdom of God. We cannot walk this world alone. We need each other. Amen. We need the encouragement of each other. God is three persons in one. He is a community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What was he doing before he created man? He was loving on Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They were, that's where we get love, is from God. Because he loved first. He loved us first. The concept of love comes from him. The community of the Trinity. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Part one. Greatness in the kingdom. Be humble. Get my, get my phone. There it is. Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18. If you have your paper Bible, go ahead and pull it out. If you have your electronic Bible, go ahead and pull it out, and we will read along together. Matthew, I am there. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. It's childlike faith. It's being humble. Sometimes a person asks a question without realizing its significance. This was the case when the disciples asked Jesus what, who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They may have been asking about their ranking as disciples or their importance compared to his other followers. 
But instead of praising those who had worked great miracles or made great sacrifices, Jesus explained that the greatest in the kingdom were those with humble, childlike faith. Have you met somebody who was just so humble? When, when I encounter Pastor Ryan, I always encounter somebody who's humble, somebody who's kind, somebody who is gentle. Oh my goodness, he is like, he never gets, well, in front of us anyway, he never gets razzed. He never gets his feathers ruffled. He never has this animosity about him or he never can, or just, you know, grumpy, has a bad day. At least he doesn't show it to us. I'm con I go up to him and, hey, Pastor Ryan, he's always smiling. He's just a, a humble servant of the Lord. When I think of humility, humbleness, I think of Pastor Wayne, somebody who has a humble spirit. When he first met Pastor John, he asked Pastor John. He, Pastor John pulls into, the at the time, our parking lot had painted on the curb stops, the little park stops where you pull your car in, painted Pastor. That was his reserve spot, and it was the first one right there at the front. And so he got rid of that later, but he pulled, Pastor John pulled into there. Pastor Wayne was standing there waiting for Pastor John to show up. Pastor John gets out. Hi, Pastor Wayne. He says, hi, Pastor John. He's like, what are you doing? He says, I just want to be of service. If there's anything that you need, please let me know. It's a, it's a humble, a humility. It's a humbleness in his spirit. That's something that we should all strive for. That's why I, I, I look up to these guys, not just because they're taller than me, but because they're <laughs> examples. Listen. <laughs> Jesus' disciples, Jesus' disciples, I gotta say that in word, often misunderstood the values of the kingdom and he patiently worked to correct them. It is unclear what their motivation could have been for asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The Greek term translated greater indicates rank or power. And by this point, the disciples had heard enough of Jesus' teaching to know that worldly power has no value in the kingdom of heaven. Using a readily available example, Jesus called a little child to his side. Jesus explained, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus added, anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Question number one. In what ways do we sometimes miss the difference between what is valued in the world and what is valued in the kingdom of God? Mm. The world says, go, go, you. That's a go-getter right there. That's somebody who takes charge, who knows what they're doing, and keeps moving forward, and, ah, takes on the day. Yeah, that's not necessarily... Hum, humility, humbleness. It's not really humility. A lot of times it's arrogance. Uh, there's Some people are just natural born leaders. That's just the way they're, they're made inside. There's nothing wrong with that. But having a, a humble spirit at the same time, having humility inside of you, willing to learn no matter how old we get, no matter how high up we get, we get in our education, whether we get a, a, an, an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, a doctorate, yeah. no matter what you get, always have a humble spirit and always be in a mode where you are willing to learn. Willing to Amen. learn because God is not finished with you. Yes. You're still breathing? Amen. God's not done with you yet. You're still on this side of eternity. Amen. God's not done. He's still working on us. He's still taking his hammer and chisel, no matter how old we are, and he's knocking a little piece off. A little bit here, a little bit there. Now, some of us have been a little more refined than others. But that doesn't mean that we're not done. It doesn't mean we're done. It means we still have a little bit more to do. 
And it's that little bit more sometimes that hurts the hardest. Does that make sense? And it hurts the worst. Because when you refine gold, you're bringing the impurities up to the surface and they scrape off the top. Scraping is not fun. <laughs> Let me just put that right there. Number two, how have you witnessed childlike faith in someone else's life? Yes, Jerry. Um, we had gone to Mexico and we had been praying for the people down in Mexico and my son Joseph, when we got back home, he was on the baseball team. And his friend had put his mother's class ring on his finger and it was stuck. Oh. And I'm looking down there, I see Joseph talking to the coach and everything and all of a sudden they come up to me and they said, your son said you pray for the sick and we want you to come down and pray for this young man. <laughs> oh, that's great. And I'm like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're and talking I said, about. I, I, did, I reached in my purse and I had some lip gloss and I said, Lord, this has got to be you. And hallelujah. He had an appointment the next day for the doctor to take the ring off by cutting it off. Oh. And it came off. Oh, praise God. praise God. the Lord. <laughs> That's fantastic. Like, How can he be doing this to his mother? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. He had so much faith and it would happen. That's great. Amen. That is Thank fantastic. You. I love that. Thank I love you. stories of, hey, my mom my mom prays. And I know that there's going to be this situation. She can come here and she can pray for this and it will get well. It's that simple childlike faith that you know God's going to move. You know God's going to move on behalf of this person because this person is close to God and I could get close to God too. There is a, um, there's a story. I, I, I don't want to get it, say it wrong, but I'm going to give you the gist of it. And I know it's a true story. There was, in World War II, there was a, a, um, an, a soldier from the military that was in... Europe in the European theater that was fighting and he had gotten a, a letter from his mom that his letter stated that she was going to be praying for him every day at a certain time and the captain gave the order okay we need to go take this hill we need to go and fight and he said okay just a few minutes and the captain's like no we need to go right now and he's like no just just let's give it a few minutes and, and he, go, he storms off, comes back. He says, why haven't you moved? He says, I'm waiting. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for my mom to finish her prayer. She was in the States. He was in the European theater. But he knew she was praying. She, he knew she could touch the heart of God. And he wouldn't go out until he knew he was under cover of prayer. I, I remember that that story. I remember hearing that, and I know it's true. I'll have to look it up for you guys, and I'll tell you where, where it's at, what, what it is. Uh, seek the lost, Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 through 14. Verse 6. Okay, we're going to carry on where we were. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with one, only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. This is uh, 6 through 14. Verse 10. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven there are their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. Verse 12. If, I, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. 
Verse 14. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. It's through 14. That was it. God is concerned with the salvation of every person, not just the people we like, <laughs> the people we get along with, not just the people that we rub shoulders with. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Not just that one, but the one that you look in the grocery store and you're like, no, I don't want to see it. Or the one that you see at church that sits on the other side. I've mentioned this before. It sits on the other side of the sanctuary. Well, you, you saw them. It's like you're going to go over there. <laughs> You've never had that experience, have you? No, not at all. <laughs> it's part of that earlier part where, you know, where you confess your sin to one another, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Yes. Extra grace required people, yes. <laughs> Not just the people we like. God is interested and concerned with the salvation of everybody. And he notices when his children are wounded. Jesus had strong words for people who tempt others to sin or stand in the way of anyone coming to him. Jesus warned more mature believers to avoid causing his little ones to stumble. He was referring not just to children, but to everyone who believes in him. Jesus' point was clear. Leading others into sin has serious consequences. Jesus also uses strong imagery when he says it would be better to cut off a hand or foot or gouge out an eye than to be subject to the sin they cause. Jesus was not advocating self-harm. Instead, he was using hyperbole or exaggeration to make a point. He wanted his listeners to understand the extreme danger of sin. Sin is dangerous and nothing to be played with. So, number one, question number one. In what ways do believers sometimes hinder other people's faith? Oh, well, if you would just live a little better... You know, you wouldn't have this trial that you're going through. Maybe you sinned somewhere. Uh, there's sin in your life. That's why you're sick. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not why you're sick. Well, maybe because, you know, sometimes the act of some sins that does bring sickness, it does bring pain sometimes, but not always. Sometimes you just get sick. I was earlier this year. Christy was last week or a couple weeks ago. But it's not because there was sin in our lives. The danger of sin should be avoided at all costs. Sometimes we see it and we're like, man, that sounds, that sounds kind of interesting. I wonder what that's like. Don't wonder. Guard yourself. In what ways do believers sometimes hinder other people's faith? Because you're not measuring up, you're not living righteously enough? Well, wait a second. Whose, whose standard should we be setting ourselves to? The standard of the word of God, not to each other. The standard of, of God's word, of his word printed out, the Bible, that's where we should be setting our standard, not each other. Well... They wear that nice suit every Sunday. They wear that nice dress every Sunday. They look so nice and cheery. And that doesn't mean they got they ain't got problems. You know, the, the whole idea of what ways do some believers hinder other people's faith? Don't be so quick to create. Yes, Peggy. I was going to say sometimes by it our negative attitude yes. or uh, our behavior that doesn't, doesn't line up with what we what we say. You yes, know? Exactly. That'll hinder others for sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> when you come into church, do you have a scowl on your face? <laughs> you know, when I walked through the foyer, was it this Sunday? I think it was this Sunday. This is exactly what my face looked like. And Pastor Wayne came up to me. Yes? <laughs> he says, 
are you concentrating on something? <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> I was running around trying to find all the communion cups, you know, I was trying to refill things constantly. That's what I was doing on, on Sunday morning. That's why some of you may have seen me and some of you may not have. Uh, it's because I'm running around. And so when I'm running around, I'm concentrating. My brow furrows. It's just natural. You see my dad from a distance and his, his normal complexion or whatever face is like, Vroom. but you get up to him and you say, hey, how you doing? You know, and it completely changes. So yes, absolutely. Be aware of what the joy that we have in our hearts should be shown on our faces. Okay, let's move on. Number two, um, what steps can Christians take to show that everyone is valuable to God? Go and encourage each other. Encourage one another in the Lord. The Lord has forgiven me, so how can I not forgive you? Oh my goodness, the Lord has forgiven me. For the wrongs I've done, you don't even know what I've done, type of a thing. You know, I'm speaking hypothetically. You know, it, absolutely. And you share the love that God has first shown you. Number two, part two, corrective discipline in the church. Address, uh, address? Address conflict, excuse me. Matthew 18 Verses 15 through 17. We'll move on. If another believer sins against you, go privately and put point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you, you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, three steps. First, you go to them privately. And say, ah, get away from me. I don't like you. Well, you did this. I don't care. I'm going to do it again. Watch me. You know. Okay, then you take another person, take two people with you. Hey, you did this. Yeah, I did that to him. Watch, I'm going to do it again. And, oh, kind of grumpy person. And then, after that, third step, go to the church. The church approaches that person. Hey, you did this, you did such and such. Yeah, I sure did. And then he says it again. Watch, I'm going to do it again. And he kicks him in the ribs again. I don't know. You know, something stupid. It, honestly, it's stupid. Apologize for it. Get over it. Yes. And, and make reconciliation with your brother, sister. And become one again. Unity in the church. Yes. My goodness. Because if you don't, church has its right to be able to say, you know what? You're not welcome here anymore. Whoa. President Ronald Reagan once said, peace is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to cope with conflict by peaceful means. Man. Yeah, that is the truth. The ability to cope, the ability to deal with conflict by peaceful means. I come to you because we have this issue and I want to make this right. I want to do what I can to make this right. That's peace. Anytime people form a community, conflict is inevitable because we all come from different walks of life. We all have different ideas. The same thing with the marriage. You have a man and a woman who comes to the stove and the man knows how to cook his way and the woman knows how to cook her way. And seldom do they meet. It's not necessarily the same way. So the man backs off and lets the woman do it. <laughs> do the dishes. <laughs> yeah, and then the man does the dishes, that's right. <laughs> and then the man goes outside and grills barbecue. <laughs> okay, anyway. 
Jesus knew there would be conflict within the family of God, and he detailed a plan for resolving it in a way that benefits each individual and maintains unity and peace in the local church. Jesus describes a four-step method for resolving church conflict. One, if one believer sins against another, the offended person should go privately to the offender and tell him his fault. This gives the offender an opportunity to repent and restore the relationship. Number two, if the offending party refuses to listen and pursue reconciliation, then the offended party should take one or two others along with them and repeat the process. Does this sound like a legal mumbo jumbo? Well, it kind of is. This is the steps. Number three, if the individual still refuses to repent and be reconciled, the situation should be brought before the church. Number four, if the person who has sinned still refuses to respond, he or she should be treated like an unbeliever. Cut them off. Say, sorry, you're not welcome back. If you're going to continue to live this way, behind closed doors with your spouse or your loved one or whatever, you're going to continue to live that way, you are not welcome. That's what... Jesus is saying here. Discretion is a key ingredient when following these steps. Most situations can be successful resolved using just the first step. Keeping the issue between the two people who are directly involved. People who make minor errors in judgment as they are growing spiritually should be treated with grace and sometimes these offenses may not even need to be pointed out. If it's minor, hey, did you see what you just did? What? Ah, oh, man. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, let's move on. Easy. Yes. So I try to be with my kids, but, you know, every once in a while, I get a little more brain functions. <laughs> okay, okay. Number uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love does not hold grudges and will hardly notice when others do it wrong. Love, love, do everything with love, saturated with love. Question number one, why do you think Jesus placed a high value on conflict resolution? So there'd be unity in the church. So we'd be as one, singing in one accord, not just the Honda, but in one accord, one people singing praises to the Lord. If there's strife in the church, how does that sound to God's ear? Oh, that person's not getting along with that person. Oh, this, these are my kids. They're worried. We are God's children. We're believers in the Lord. We're believers in, believers in Jesus Christ. We should be one. I'm going to keep moving on. If the process Jesus provided for dealing with conflict has been followed without successful resolution, what is the redemptive value of removing an unrepentant person from the church? Whoa. What is the redemptive value? It means everything. To redeem that person see them come back to see them come back to Christ to see them have a humble spirit church unity I need to move forward it's 8 o'clock we're on page 3 church unity Matthew chapter 18 verses 18 through 20 I tell you the truth whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. This is New Living Translation. That's why it sounds kind of different. I'm going to change it to the New King James so that we can hear. Oh, and then it jumped on me. Verse 18. I'm getting there. Again, assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Verse 19, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. 
At this point in his teaching, Jesus' language shifted to indicate he was now directly addressing the 12 disciples. Jesus had already given Peter the power to bind and loosen, and that authority was now extended to all of the apostles who functioned at the church or called out ones at the time. Eventually, this authority would be passed to the church at large, although it functions differently from the way some have taught and believed. Jesus continued his teaching about church discipline by stating, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In verse 19, Jesus extended the authority of believers to the issue of prayer. The requirement in this verse was that the believers be unified. While in John 14, 13, Jesus specified that the requests be made in my name so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. <coughs> Jesus concluded this portion of his message with a promise that he would be present when two or three are gathered together as my followers. Anytime Jesus' followers unite to worship and serve him together, they become a temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. Anytime you come together, you are a temple. You, singular person, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides inside of you. Isn't that amazing? Yes. <clears throat> I want to read something for you really quick. It's found in Psalm 84. It's verse 1. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. In the New Testament frame of mind. Yes. Who's the tabernacle? You are. You are. And what does the Bible say about you? How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. You are a lovely person. You are a lovely creation of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made for him to reside inside of you. You are lovely. You're having a bad day. Uh, I woke up this morning. I forgot to have coffee. My head is killing me because the caffeine withdrawal. You are a lovely person. Oh, man, I cut off that guy on the freeway. I really didn't mean to do that, but I did anyways. And, oh, man, now he's driving me by me, and now he's looking scowlish at me, and he's giving me hand gestures, and I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to go drive straight. Oh, I'm so sorry. You are lovely. Don't feel like it, do you? Oh. I was getting on the freeway at Cleghorn. This is a few years ago. I was getting on the freeway at Cleghorn because everything was backed up and I moved over one and I moved over two and I moved over three. And then this motorcycle came out of nowhere and he's staring at me like I was about to run him over. And I'm like, what did I do? I didn't see you. And it, he got angry. Mm. And he followed me all the way up to Oak Hills. Oh. And when he got up to Oak Hills, <laughs> He, uh, he used his fist to hit my rearview mirror on the passenger side and then took off at Oak Hills. And I was like, oh, okay. Didn't break my rearview mirror or anything. Just kind of bounced around a little bit. Okay. Broke his hand. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he broke his hand. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, how lovely is your tabernacle? Yes. <laughs> Me? <laughs> I did a dirty deed. <laughs> I cut that guy off and I didn't mean to. Uh, the, the scripture says, how lovely is your tabernacle, O yeah. Lord of hosts. Mm. Even when you don't feel like it, <laughs> offer up worship, Thank song you. of praise, yes. a sacrifice of praise. Okay, I lost my place officially. <laughs> okay, so called out ones and then uh, Jesus continued. Is teaching about church discipline by stating we went through that already. Questions. Sorry. In what ways have you heard Matthew 18, 
18 through 20 used out of context. Oh, we just read it. Matthew 18, 18 through 20. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if you, two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Well, we asked you, God. Why didn't you do it? Maybe it wasn't his will. Maybe he knew you were going to come up with a snotty remark of saying, we asked you for it. Why didn't you do it? And maybe he knew ahead of time. Where was the humility? Where was the sincere question? Uh, what ways have you heard these used out of context? Number two, how have you seen the power of a unified church impact their world? Oh my goodness. So many times. Those who are homeless, coming in for a meal, Salvation Army, given a meal and given the gospel. God's hand extended, building churches, building wells, building orphan houses, orphanages for those who are lost. I have a co-worker who is Seventh-day Adventist and he went to he went to Africa. I don't know what, what country in Africa but he went out there and he helped dig a well. He helped build uh, an orphanage. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. He said, yeah, I spent you know, a couple of months out there doing that. I'm like, you had that much vacation time? He says, yeah, I had it built up, you know, and used all my, you know, two months, eight weeks of vacation time to go and build a, a well. God's hand extended. That's what we need to be. Extended to those who are lost. How have you seen the power of a unified church impact the world? I cannot begin to tell you all of the incredible things that have happened. Now, page number four. Part three, forgiveness in the kingdom. I need to keep moving along. The mercy of God displayed. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 28. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Oh, this is a tough one, isn't it? I'm going to go to the New Living Translation so it's easy for me to read off of my uh, verse 21. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should we forgive someone who sins against me? How often should I forgive them? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars oh my goodness he couldn't pay so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt not just him be sold but his wife and his kids sold into what into slavery to work back the debt millions of dollars there'd be no way he could ever do that until death but the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. That was, okay. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Forgave. You know what that means? He didn't have to pay it back. He owed millions of dollars and he didn't have to pay it back. He was willing to work it off. The guy said, no. No, you don't have to. Don't worry about it. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, grabbed him by the throat, and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me. I'm going to go on past verse 28. I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor couldn't wait, and he had the man arrested and put in prison until he paid the full debt. After Jesus' discussion of conflict resolution, 
and corrective discipline, Peter asked about the limits of forgiveness. Jesus responded with another parable, describing the way radical forgiveness reflects the heart of God. Before we can freely forgive others as God requires, we must recognize how freely he has forgiven us. How can I not but forgive you for all that I have been forgiven of? How can I not? Peter asked a logical follow-up question to Jesus' teaching about correction and reconciliation. Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me seven times? Because my kids, they keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yeah, we're God's kids, and guess what we get to do? The same thing over and over and over, and we keep asking him for forgiveness. It's figure of speech, 70 times 7, 490 times. But you go 491 and forget it. No, I'm just kidding. It implies there is no limit to the number of times we should forgive fellow believers. It's so hard. I've taught this guy how to do this at least a dozen times, and he still doesn't know how to do this. You ever run into that situation? I have. Forgiveness, what do you do? What can I do to help you? That's what you do. You smile and you go be of service. Okay, question number one. If you were one of the followers in the crowd who heard Jesus tell this parable, how would you have felt at this point in the story? I'm supposed to forgive him 490 times? Oh, my this guy went to the judge, went to this guy. He owed millions of dollars, and that judge said, your sin debt is wiped out. You are done. No problem. Go free. And then he goes to his buddy. Hey, you owe me this money. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You owe me this money. And by his throat. Grabbed him by his throat. And would, would not give it up. How has God restored your life and your hope? How can you use that testimony to reach others? If you have sinned much, grace abounds the more. Grace covers that. Forgiveness covers it. You come to Christ. You ask for forgiveness. You turn from your wicked ways. You turn towards him. He forgives he wipes out the debt, millions of sins, essentially. And he wipes it out. How can we not extend that grace? The effects of unforgiveness. Here it is, Matthew chapter 18, verses 29. His fellow servant begged for a little more time, be patient with me, but his creditor couldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid. So verse 35, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And the king called the man and he forgave it and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Excuse me. Shouldn't you have shown mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. When someone hurts us, we are often tempted to harden our hearts or even seek retribution, unfor forgetting the magnitude of God's forgiveness and grace towards us. Unwillingness to forgive demonstrates selfishness and rebellious attitude. And it carries severe spiritual consequences. Jesus concluded the parable with a stern warning to his followers, both then and now. We have been forgiven an insurmountable debt of sin. And we must extend the same mercy to others. If we withhold forgiveness, Jesus says we will suffer the same punishment as the unforgiving debtor in his parable. Put simply, if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Question number one. Why do you think Jesus taught about forgiveness so intently? 
because he wanted humility in our hearts. He wanted forgiveness in our hearts so that everyone could be forgiven of their sins and be reconciled to God, be reconciled with each other in unity and to the Lord. What does a Christian's unwillingness to forgive reveal about, reveal about his heart, his or her heart? It's stone. That heart is stone. And the only way you're going to have a cure for a stony heart is for God to come in and rip that stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. It's the only way. God's going to have to do it. We can't do it ourselves. And we can't do it for each other. What is God saying to us? Church fellowship is kingdom fellowship. Believers must live by kingdom principles in order to thrive in community. Humility is one of God's requirements for his children. Instead of seeking positions of honor, we are to submit ourselves and willingly serve the king. When others inevitably, inevitably violate kingdom standards, we must resist the temptation to stir up strife. Did you hear what Sister Sue or, or Brother Sam did? That's just gossiping. That's stirring up strife. Choosing instead to use the process Jesus described to maintain unity. Those who have caused hurt should seek forgiveness, and those who have been hurt should show mercy. And you don't need to go around, you know what that person did to me? Because that person who you're telling will pick up your offense towards that person. And then you're going to have two people angry at that one person. Yeah. Oh, do you hear what that person did to me? And then you have more people picking up their offense. Okay, let's move on. This kingdom of community life will increase our effectiveness, allowing us to reach new people and bring them into the kingdom. Ministry in action. Evaluate your desire for power and position in the local church and resolve to show humility. Avoid gossip. Follow the process of biblical church discipline when someone in the fellowship violates kingdom principles. Number three, consider those close to you who have hurt you and choose to forgive them just as God has forgiven you. This part is so difficult. It is so hard to go up to somebody and say, I've got this pain in my heart. I've been offended, and I am asking God to help me through this process. I need you to help me through this process, too. And you let them know what has been going on. And then they, if they're hum humble, and if they're truly a servant of God, they're going to say, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Coming up next week, lesson eight. The king is coming. Oh, looking forward to that one. Jesus Christ came. He will come again. If you want to read ahead, the scriptures are listed there. Matthew 24, that famous chapter, all the way to 24, 25, verse 46. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this this time of learning how to be humble, learning how to forgive one another, learning how to ask for forgiveness, learning, Lord Jesus, how to be merciful with each other. Lord, knowing that greatness in your kingdom comes with humility. Lord Jesus, help us to be humble. Lord, you said that if we humble ourselves, you would lift us up. So, Lord, that is what we do even now, that we humble ourselves in your sight, Lord. And we ask that you would touch us and you would help us to forgive those who are around us and help us, Lord, to go to those who we have offended and ask them to forgive us. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would touch us tonight, that you would be with us as we go our separate ways. And bring us back safely on Sunday. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now don't forget, you're lovely. <laughs> Have a good night.
There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring His richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless.